Good afternoon, everybody. I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of CARE Germany and the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom to our web talk, Suffering in Silence. This event is the first in a 10 part series, which will shine a light on the 10 most underreported humanitarian crises in 2020. And today we will focus on Eastern Ukraine. That's why I am your moderator today. My name is Gesine Donblüt. I'm a journalist based in Berlin. I've been living in Moscow for several years as a correspondent for Deutschland Radio, and I'm focusing on Eastern Europe. More than 13,000 people have lost their lives due to the war in the Donbass since 2014. Shelling, decline in economic activity, destroyed infrastructure, fires plus COVID-19 have created a humanitarian crisis. Up to 5 million people are in need of humanitarian aid. What political and historical background does this conflict have? How is the humanitarian situation on the ground? Why do we hear relatively little about it? Is it possible to improve the humanitarian situation without having found a political solution? We will discuss these questions with four excellent experts on and from the region. There is Igor Michnik. He joins us from Slovyansk in Eastern Ukraine, where he leads the civil society center Drukarnia, run by the German-Russian exchange DRA. Oleksi Matsuka is with us. He is an award-winning journalist from the Donbas region, currently working for TV in Kiev. We have Irina Solonenko from the German think tank Liberale Moderne in Berlin. And I welcome James Wetherill from the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA in Ukraine. All of you in the audience are invited to send us your questions. Please use the Q&A function and please be short and precise in your questions. And before we start our discussion, I give the floor to Sabine Wilke, Director of Communications at CARE Germany for a short input about the work of CARE and its reports suffering in silence on forgotten crisis. Please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gesine. It's an honor to be here uh, with all of you. And uh, I'm also looking very much forward to the discussion. Did you know that uh, in Burundi last year, um, there were severe floods and landslides, leaving over 2.3 million people in need of humanitarian aid? Are you aware that in Pakistan, there are 49 million people who do not have enough food to eat? So we know that there are countries in crisis every year. There's an abundance of disasters, conflicts, and other humanitarian crises. But not all of these crises make news. There may be many reasons for this, which we will discuss hopefully here, but the result is still the same for each and every person living in this crisis. No attention, no, no world or no media attention means little to no aid, no political will to solve the crisis, and almost no hope for relief. CARE is one of the biggest humanitarian aid organizations worldwide. We were founded after the Second World War to help Europe recover and rebuild. Tomorrow, exactly 75 years ago, the first of millions of care packages arrived in France and was handed to a person there. A couple of weeks later, in July of 19, uh, 1946, <laughs> The first care packages arrived in Germany. In total, 10 million packages were delivered to needy families in Germany. Around 100 million packages were delivered throughout um, Europe. We are really, really proud of this legacy and we strive to live, live up to this tradition. Today, each year, CARE supports around 90 million people in over 100 countries with humanitarian aid and development projects. We always put gender equality and women's rights at the heart of our work. For the past five years, we've been publishing a report, an annual report called Suffering in Silence. It includes a ranking of the 10 humanitarian crises that received the least global media attention. We established this ranking by first adding up all of the crises that have happened in the past year and that have affected at least 1 million people. So for 2020, this list included a total of 45 crises, from well-known conflicts such as the war in Syria to lesser-known tropical cyclones, for example. 
we then screened online news in five of the biggest um, global languages throughout the year and looked for mentions of these crises in the media. The result is this top 10 list, which we published in January. And it is the basis for this Naumann Foundation's discussion series. Care is extremely happy to be a partner for this series because this is exactly what we aim to do with this report, to raise awareness, not just on the day of the publication of Suffering in Silence, but throughout the year, and to give a voice to people affected of these crises, people working in this crisis, being engaged to alleviate suffering and helping um, to, um, to make make this uh, these crises uh, go go away <laughs> in, a, in a sense. So I think it's time to really give a big thank you to Friedrich Naumann Stiftung uh, for enabling uh, this 10 part series and I'm really looking forward to um, to all of the um, to all of the uh, the events. Just to give you a small idea and I'll finish with that um, of the silence we are talking about in terms of media coverage. Um, all of these 10 crises that we listed in 2020 received a total of 13,000 media hits globally, 13,000. In comparison, the launch of PlayStation 5 received a total of 335,000 media hits. So a gaming device receives 30 times more attention than 10 humanitarian crises put together. And these numbers are really hard to grasp. So I'm really looking forward to hearing more from experts, from activists and humanitarians in each country. The Ukraine has never made the list before. It's the first time that a European country is on this list uh, last year. 3.4 million people are dependent on humanitarian aid in the country, and you will hear more from our uh, distinguished speakers. Um, I look also forward to hearing more about the subsequent countries such as Burundi, Papua New Guinea or Zambia. And I hope you will all join us um, in listening in and giving a voice to our global neighbors uh, in this crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Sabine Wilke, for these general explanations. We will now turn to our today's region, Eastern Ukraine, and I ask Igor Michnik to give us some historical and political background and general thoughts about the still ongoing war, please. Many thanks for the introductory words, Kizina and Sabina. I'm grateful to the Friedrich Naumann Foundation and care, and care for having invited me to speak on this topic. It is really a great honor for me. As it's unfortunately often the case, the core of the conflict in Ukraine is in fact simple and complex at the same time. So the conflict is in fact about whether Ukraine is celebrating this year, 30 years of independence from the Soviet Union, has the right and opportunity to leave Russia's self-proclaimed sphere of geopolitical interests or not. And whether Ukraine, its government and its people have the right to pursue membership in the European Union and membership in other Western alliances such as the NATO or not. The key actor the, which tries to prevent Ukraine's succession to these political systems is, in my humble view, the Russian government and Russian and pro-Russian political elites connected to it. Um, a major critical juncture, to get back to the historical uh, question that Gesina raised, was reached in the end of November 2013. Back then, the former Ukrainian president Viktor Yanukovych, a Russian ally, decided in the very last minute to give in to Russian pressure and not to sign the associ association agreement with the European Union in the framework, framework of its uh, Eastern Partnership Program. That decision sparked civic mass protests in Kyiv's Independence Square, which is better known as the Maidan. <clears throat> I'm, really, I'm really sorry if I mispronounce something or my voice sounds a bit uh, weird because I'm uh, actually called a cold, so I'm terribly sorry for this, <clears throat> just on a side note. Um, these weeks of protests at the Maidan, in which a variety of people demonstrated for democratization and Europeanization of an independent Ukraine, can be also seen as a civic awakening of a large part of the contemporary civil society across the whole country. Yernukovic's yeah, go uh, government reacted violently and cold-blooded, while the civic unrest continued back then. That led to the removal of Yernukovic from office in February 2014. He has fled the country together with some of his close political allies from his political machinery, the so-called party of regions to Russia. And the Russian political and imperial narrative, which, and this is important really to emphasize, always saw Ukraine as a kind of satellite state, the following, uh, the following takeover of the political power by a quickly consolidated pro-Western inter interim government was considered a coup d'etat, and this wording is still often used. 
the change of political actors in Ukraine was basically perceived by Russia as a sudden loss of political and economic leverage in one of its supposedly closest neighbor countries, a country which Russia and large parts of the Russian political elites up to date never have considered before as a fully independent nation that can choose its own social and political trajectory. And therefore, Russian political actors initiated two massive military operations, trying to regain strategic influence over Ukraine again. Within a week from late February 2014 through the beginning of March 2014, Russia invaded and subsequently annexed the Crimean, Crimean Peninsula. That was the first firm formal annexation of territory in Europe since 1945. And it was, and this is important also to emphasize, a massive disregard of international law and Ukraine's territorial sovereignty. Parallel to these developments in Ukraine, Russian intelligence incited violent riots in the east uh, of the country, resulting in what we know already see as the ongoing Donbas conflict. It was a hybrid military and um, disinformation campaign through which Russia ignited a chaos by exploiting local loyalties and playing on Soviet and post-Soviet resentments of parts of the population in East Ukraine. Armed men, many of them Russian military staff, such as, and because I'm based in Slovyansk, it's important also to mention him, Russian military staff such as Igor Gilkin here in Slovyansk started seizing police buildings, municipalities and other buildings in order to occupy the cities in the Donetsk and Luhansk region. That was basically the beginning of the Russian-Ukrainian war in East Ukraine in 2014. The so-called contact line, which is now dividing the territories controlled by the Ukrainian government from the territories controlled by the Russian-backed puppet regimes of the so-called Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic, did not change significantly since February 2015 anymore. And that month, in this February, the second Minsk protocols were signed by Russia, representatives of the so-called um, republics and the OCE. Talks about the resolution of the conflict continue now since then in the Normandy format. It involves Germany, Ukraine, Ukraine, uh, and it involves Germany, Ukraine, France, and Russia. <clears throat> the situation along the contact line was family calm since July 2020 when the current Ukrainian president Zelensky broke the ceasefire in the region, yet the violations of the ceasefire increased significantly as of 2021 again. In March and April, Russia amassed a troop contingent from the north, south, and east of Ukraine bigger than any other mobilization since the year 2014. The national observers were wondering whether Russia intended to test the new American administration and its political and security command, uh, commitment to Ukraine, whether Russia was preparing another invasion of Ukrainian territories, or whether they simply tried to push more pressure on the Ukrainian, Ukrainian president, who refuses to give in to Russian pressure up till now um, to include the ongoing um, to include into the non ongoing negotiations the uh, occupied territories in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, or I mean, the representatives of these. <clears throat> a part of the Russian troops was withdrawn, a significant contingent of around 80,000 people stays at the Ukrainian border up till now. At the same time, the so-called DPR and LPR get steadily more integrated into Russia's political, economic, and security structures. And up to half a million people, some people say 400,000, others say 600,000 gained Russian citizenship by now. Ukrainian civil society, who emerged as a major actor, accompanying the various, uh, various, uh, various parallel political developments in the country, um, while also helping at the same time living pe the people living in a conflict zone, stays still alarmed. One of our partner organizations in the Luhansk region started a call for volunteers, for example, in order to be prepared for the case of another escalation in East Ukraine. In both cases, Crimea and Donbas, Russian political elites weaponized a certain nationalist idea, and we can talk about this in a um, subsequent discussion, then nationalist idea of defending Russians abroad. With this vague concept, basically any person speaking Russian, not only Russian passport holders, can be defined as a Russian by the Kremlin. The Kremlin uses the concept of its supposed camp, uh, compatriots abroad nowadays regularly to justify any kind of foreign intervention in its neighborhood, particularly in countries like Ukraine that, as I mentioned, Russian political elites still perceive as essentially Russian. There was, however, a close connection between certain Russian political and business circles with various actors and the nowadays conflict affected Donetsk and Luhansk regions. And the wide 1990s that many people in the region, but similarly also in Russia and other post-Soviet states, remember as a period of devastating poverty, criminality and political anarchy, local business clans emerged in the regions. These clans merged their economic power with, local, uh, with political and social influence in the region. The power vertical in this region was closely connected to similar circles in Russia. So therefore, the fall of the Yanukovych government in 2014 was perceived as a serious threat to local oligarchs who had strongly relied on Russian businesses. 
so the and now I'm coming to the humanitarian issue more. So the immediate consequence of the more were merged with a already progressing economic deterioration of this post-industrial region exists and existing social problems. These factors continue mutually reinforcing each other here. So seven years since the beginning of the war, roughly 3.4 million people are still in dire need of humanitarian aid. Around 1.2 million of them are elderly people, which makes Ukraine, the Ukrainian crisis, one of the, or actually the oldest conflict worldwide, which is because of all the elderly affected here. Um, but, and this is also important to mention, seven years after the beginning of the war, the humanitarian crisis is transforming. And this is probably also, and this is my uh, view on this, and this is the reason why it makes it more difficult to grasp for an international audience, which is not daily focused on Ukraine, as many people here now in the audience, uh, many here now in the audience or uh, on our panel. This complexity might be that just be simply the reason why the reporting about this crisis is fading from international headlines. So while humanitarian kits cover the basic needs of people in the conflict zone, they do not tackle the grim economic situation of many people in the region. In the region. They do not tackle the risk of environmental disasters in the region, the psych psychological trauma that people have here, which interrelates with alcohol and drug abuse, suicides, and also gender-based violence. The latter increased massively in the conflict zone throughout the year of 2020, so with the beginning of the pandemic. And all of this comes now on top of the grim security situation, which in April was close to another escalation. We were very close to a full-scale war on Ukrainian territory, and we need to keep this in mind. To shed light on these complex issues, complex issues remains an incredible challenge in a world which remains still quite self-absorbed, self-absorbed with COVID, <laughs> which remains quite still self-absorbed with COVID restrictions. Many things. <coughs> Thank you, Igor, for this focused uh, presentation. And we will now start with our uh, discussion. And I would like to ask uh, the participants, the panelists, to switch on their cameras, please. Um, Igor, you mentioned many points that we should continue to talk about. But let's at first have a deeper look um, into the humanitarian situation. Um, Igor, you mentioned that uh, we have a dividing front line, uh, so-called contact line. We have the territory which is not under control of the um, government in Kiev. Oleksiy, um, how does the humanitarian situation, the situation of the people in their everyday life differ on both sides of the front line? Um, please switch on your... Yeah. microphone thank yes thank you Thanks. for thank you for this event i think it's really important for the people average people who live in uh very difficult conditions during seven years and during this whole period um, me personally my uh colleagues from other uh editions and other news news uh outlets we explain what happened in gray so-called gray zone and in uncontrolled territories and over the past few weeks, we witnessed several grave attacks targeting civilian infrastructure in the Donetsk region, causing damage to a hospital, as well as critical um, question for water infrastructure, which is cutting of water supply near one and one million people on both sides of the contact line. And I uh, heard Igor who mentioned about narratives about the conflict and they really absolutely different on both sides these narratives I mean and so constructive and respectful dialogue is needed in order to build social cohesion in my opinion and the government humanitarian community and local civil society organizations also media outlets should be more involved and this process and uh, this dialogue will likely be needed at every level of Ukrainian society. And consultations should be as uh, inclusive as possible and involve IDPs as well as host communities, re uh, returners, and people living in a non-government control area. Uh, unfortunately, today media are very limited in the region and uh, uh, I see that it's absolutely not enough information in mainstream media about Donbass situation, even inside Ukraine, because uh, big Ukrainian national media 
often ignore the needs of average people and mostly focus on the military questions, not on humanitarian situation. And I understand this because not every journalist wants to be a military journalist. And of course, this continued uh, conflict, it is a big corrosion of the journalist profession. So every year we gave the community, professional community for Donbass Media Forum to discuss the current situation with media covering and media consumption of our audience. And you can find more uh, on the specific sites about Donbass Media Forum. And also another problem for covering the situation in Donbass that our audience very separated and people want more clickbait of information. And I know I read your letter when you asked about the public interest, about uh, the questions how this damage during uh, conflict period. And I confirm that uh, really uh, public interest journalism uh, damaged by clickbaiting from the social networks and YouTube algorithms uh, that require more clickbait from uh, a journalist. And in work, clickbait is always polarization and, uh, uh, and the signs against some groups in Donbass. Thank you. Um, excuse me, yeah. Alexei, if I interrupt you, I think uh, let us come back to uh, the very important uh, point of the rule of journalists and how difficult it is to work. But at first, I would like to ask James, um, can you tell us a bit more about how humanitarian aid right now is possible, how it is brought to the people? Because, I mean, we have a situation, Igor mentioned that we don't have a real ceasefire, um, a real reliable um, if you follow the OSC monitoring missions reports, it's a rather frustrating read. Uh, on 8th of May, for example, you had 663 ceasefire violations only in Donetsk region, a region more than 100 in, uh, in Luhansk region. And this is, of course, um, uh, something that I think creates problems, also practical problems for the organizations working on the ground. Can you tell us a bit more about this? Yeah, of course, I agree no, with I'm you. Sorry, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Alexei, I wanted to ask James to answer this question. Thank you. No, I think uh, clearly when you're looking at the numbers, uh, the numbers can get distorted as well. I think the OSCE counts individual gunfire as an individual violation. So. There's different ways of recording it, but nevertheless, uh, what we're seeing now is the level of, of hostile activity um, during April, for example, is almost at the level of, as it was last year. So despite having, last April, so despite having the, um, the comprehensive ceasefire from last July, we've been seeing a gradual increasing of, of the number of, of incidents, I guess we call them, um, since that point. And you're right. I mean, I think the the ongoing incidents makes life very difficult for the civilian population on both both sides. I mean, it, it's clear that we have um, the area along the contact line, especially five kilometers either side of the contact line, is where you have the greatest impact of the hostilities. This is the reach of the the weaponry that's used. Increasingly these days, we're seeing heavier weaponry being used, which means a longer distance that they can can reach. But the primary people who are you know the first impacted by the by the crisis are those that are living within the the, the weapon range that, are, that is being used by both sides. Now that of course is a limited population, and the population that we talk about 3.4 million people in need is is significantly higher. It's a large population within uh, the non-government controlled area, and it's also um, a large number of, of displaced people. The official statistics for displaced people is about one and a half million. Of those, we see about. Um, reality, about half of them are really IDPs. There are many others who are actually still have, have returned to their place of residence. They, they, they remain as listed as displaced people in order to receive benefits. Um, they've actually had no other place to go and have returned to their homes in non-government controlled areas. Um, this impacts, largely impacts the, the pensioner age population who cannot receive their pensions without crossing into the government controlled areas to receive them. With the closure of the contact line over the last year, because of COVID, we've seen a dramatic deterioration of the, of the situation, especially amongst this population, 
who no longer can access their pensions. And so if you're thinking about a pension of 100 to $200 a month, um, if you are not able to get that, or if you are willing to actually cross um, prior to the beginning of COVID to receive it, um, you're really in need because of the, the, the long lines you had to wait in to, to cross the contact line. Um, before the, the COVID situation, we were seeing about 1 in a 1.1, 1.2 million crossings per month. That means in both directions, so about 650,000 Sorry, 600,000 crossings in, in each direction. Since um, the closure of the contact line a year ago, we've seen a 90, 97% drop in the number of people who are, have been crossing the contact line. And of those who have been crossing, it's about 95% uh, of those are coming from Luhansk. And so the people of Donetsk are being, Donetsk non-government controlled areas of, of Donetsk are being primarily impacted. This has also impacted our ability to provide humanitarian response. Um, in the government controlled areas, in fact, it's not actually that difficult. The fighting is, is concentrated in certain areas and it's not all the time. And, and we are able to access into these areas without much difficulty, because of course, humanitarian operations aren't happening every single day. You'd make deliveries on certain days and you can arrange windows of silence if necessary, windows of silence being um, periods of, of no hostilities to deliver the, such assistance. In the non-government controlled areas, it's, it's significantly more difficult, especially to deliver humanitarian convoys of assistance to the population. Um, we'd have, we've had periods when the, the contact line is completely closed and we aren't able to deliver any, any convoys at all. Um, and therefore we are completely reliant upon goods that have already been um, delivered into non-government controlled areas or local procurement within non-government controlled areas. In the NGCA, it is also very difficult to, to for us as, as humanitarians to access the population in need, to identify what their needs are, to actually travel because it can, the controls that are put on the humanitarians is, is very high in terms of what we're able to do and what, where we're we able to visit. Um, that being said, we are able to access a significant population, but because of that, the number of people that we are able to reach in the non-government controlled areas is much lower than, than the need. And I'll close with just a, an example. Last year, um, we had identified about 2 million people on both sides of the contact line that are in, in need of assistance. And we are able to reach about 1.4, 1.45 million people with some kind of assistance, not a complete package, but something. Of those, only 266,000 were in the non-government controlled areas, even though we had seen that the actual level of need was higher in the non-government controlled areas. And that's because of our access restrictions and our inability to actually operate in the non-government controlled areas. I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, James. And I want to repeat just, you mentioned one and a half million people are IDPs, internally displaced persons. They live in other parts of Ukraine now. Um, Irina, a question to you. Um, James mentioned that the, the access uh, to the non-governmental controlled areas is difficult. Um, what does Russia do in order to improve the humanitarian uh, situation? How interested are the so-called separatists in um, investments, for example, in really developing uh, their infrastructure and in getting the situation better? Um. Thank you. Well, I don't see any interest on the side of Russia and the so-called authorities of the occupied territories to improve the, the lives of people there. Uh, we don't know much about what is happening there, but uh, apparently these are these regions or territories are used to um, are used to destabilize Ukraine as a whole. Yeah, to take away efforts which are needed to conduct reforms to. Uh, conduct uh, to integrate with European Union is to improve the lives of people in general. Uh, so I don't think that Russia is really interested. Uh, moreover, we, we saw that uh, there's a, a build up of troops and uh, um, also in the, in the occupied territories, especially in Crimea, we don't talk about Crimea today, but it's important to talk about Crimea as well. In the past seven years, it has become military, heavily militarized, and this is a trend which continue. Russia has big planes, apparently, with respect to militarization of Crimea, uh, which used to be a, an area or the, the uh, peninsula where people would have vacation, uh, uh, recreation area. Uh, it's not anymore, and it's not going to be in the near future because Russia has other plans, apparently. There are also, also uh, very harsh human rights violations, both in occupied territories and in the and in Crimea, especially against the Crimean Tatars. 
Uh, in the occupied territories, we know that there are uh, some sort of um, uh, prison, prisons. Yeah, but people are kept in the, but people are kept without any respect for their rights. There have been reports about this by, interna by international and Ukrainian organizations. Um, um, yeah, so it's a very difficult situation. And uh, um, I would like, to, I think when we talk about various categories of people which are affected by this conflict, uh, some of them already, or most of them were already mentioned. I will, so internally displaced people, one and a half million. We also have to mention veterans, over 400,000 veterans, and many of them uh, have uh, many of them with um, psychological problems, with problems of adaptation to the normal life. Uh, there are organizations which help them. We have the Ministry of Veterans in Ukraine, but still, uh, this is also a very vulnerable uh, uh, category of population. Also, we should talk about um, people in the, we mentioned about, we talked about people who are um, on the both sides of the contact line, but for instance, uh, there are 18, um, uh, 18 constituencies in the, which are close to the contact line on the Ukrainian side, where, where local elections could not take place in October. So half a million of voters were deprived, deprived of their right to vote and elect the authorities and uh, uh, live under uh, bizarre conditions at the moment. Uh, so we have to be aware of all the different uh, categories of people who were affected by this conflict, uh, not just in the immediate, immediate uh, um, uh, situation, but also broader, broader. And Crimea should be mentioned as well, Crimean Tatars as a specially vulnerable group. Thank you, Irina. Um, you said Russia has definitely no interest to develop the region. Um, has Ukraine the interest? I remember that at the beginning of the conflict or the war in 2014, we should call it a war because it is a war, um, there was something like an attitude, you know, those people in uh, the in the Donbass on the other side of the conflict line, they supported the separatists, so why should we help them now? Did this change, um, Igor? How is you are living in uh, Slovyansk, which is not far away from um, from the contact line? Um, how is the attitude of the people living uh, close to the so-called separatist areas, um, according uh, in uh, their attitude towards the people on the other side? Is there solidarity? Actually, I would be interested to hear also uh, Alexei afterwards on this particular question. Who knows, actually, the city probably a bit better. <clears throat> so, like, um, I can compare mainly with 2018, because 2018 was the first time I moved to Slovensk. Worked for a couple of months for a humanitarian organization here, and then in, again in 2019 to start the center here. Um, so, again, it's uh, as I started also my presentation, it's quite a complex question. So, there is, I think, a de definite interest in developing the region and also um, desire by the people here to see certain uh, investments coming. Um, I would interpret the uh, policy of the Ukrainian government, but also regional administrations uh, as a uh, fight for winning hearts and minds. So basically to develop this, uh, the government controlled side of the Donetsk and Luhansk regions uh, in order to show that prosperity and uh, good living conditions are possible here under Ukrainian rule. And um, this is uh, this is showed in a, in a variety of ways. So first, even if I compare like um, how Slavyansk developed as, since the first time I've moved here, a lot of cafes are developing, small and middle-sized businesses are opening. Many, unfortunately, uh, were in severe crisis then due to COVID again. So there's a massive fragility also of different kinds of businesses and investment. Uh, in the in the region, but uh, people that I talk to, particularly younger people, um, remember they do not they don't remember anymore. If I'm okay, I will I will just uh, shed light on an example. I was talking to a person, for instance, who's 18, 19, and who's from Slovansk herself, and uh, she was telling me, for instance, and she's kind of here in this NGO bubble, quite active, that she personally whose conscious political thinking started in 2014 cannot remember the city anymore as a place where there were no possibilities of activism and this is uh, in my opinion like a very good tendency but if you talk to elderly people 
cab drivers, for instance, or people who um, are quite nostalgic about what they had in the Soviet Union, Soviet times, a certain kind of security and prosperity, um, which unfortunately shut down from everything which is uh, emerging now around them to some extent, they will tell you that everything is going to hell, everything is bad and everything is not really developing. Mm, I was quite impressed in March, for instance, when I uh, went to, with uh, one of our partner organizations uh, to Novotroitsk. Uh, so there's also a strong development when it comes to the entry exit checkpoints, many of them funded by, uh, um, co-funded by the Ukrainian government, financially supported by many international donors, are also trying to create kind of, let's say, more ple more pleasant environment for people when I when it comes to um, getting their pensions, when it uh, comes to getting other kind of bureaucracy done. Of course, there are a lot of things of which uh, still can be done much better, but there is definitely some improvement and some, or I see at least some will uh, by regional administrations and the national administrations. I think the biggest political signal to start this kind of wave of developing the region was probably set in Mariupol. Um, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think October 2019, when there was big investment in Unity Forum. Um, and uh, I was in Mariupol in 2016 for the first time, and then recently again in also March 2021. And I could not recognize the city anymore. It was just a totally different place, a vibrant emerging place with uh, loads of hipster bars, young people, um, a beautiful city center, then new, like new squares also developing. So I, I don't know if this is a, a satisfying qu uh, reply to your question, but there's a lot of fun. Oh, this is all like concerning the, the developments in the government controlled areas. Yes, but yes. How is the attitude towards uh, the people on the other side of the line? Maybe Oleksi, you could tell us a bit, a, a bit more. Yeah, I see uh, from the video from occupied territory or, or NGC area that uh, people, they are looking for consideration of their identity, I mean, in uncontrolled territory. And the same process sometimes we feel in and see in Ukrainian part. And people tr try to trust pro-Russian media or pro-Ukrainian media because, as I say, they they looking for confirmation of their identity. And in this process, professional journalism suffers. It's because you understand, uh, uh, because it's always when you try to explain something, what happened in Ukrainian side, you, you uh, show the situation, what um, Igor mentioned now about city center of Mariupol and others questions, improving of this and others. It always looks like on the another side in occupied territory that you are Ukrainian propagandist or you want to, imp to, to show more pro-Ukrainian position. But uh, we have in Ukrainian part a lot, a lot of Ukrainian investigative journalists who also criticized Ukrainian government and Ukrainian president and, and uh, government steps to the reconciliation and peace building and others. So I think that uh, partly people who live in occupied territory, they partly skeptical and another part is negative toward Ukraine, but it's very difficult to evaluate in such, in these conditions uh, because people don't say, they don't want to say openly their opinions because they don't sure in their tomorrows and their security. Uh, questions. Many of my uh, many of my classmates from my school, because I'm from Donetsk city original, and they were not born in USSR or uh, they were not grow during USSR period. But now many of them are fighting for the ideas of USSR as part of pro-Russian separatist groups. So it means maybe, in my opinion, that young people who live now in uncontrolled territory and who uh, faced with the uh, pro-Russian propaganda, it doesn't mean that they refuse Ukraine or they try to cancel their feeling toward Ukraine. So it's my opinion uh, about uncontrolled territory. Irina, you are nodding. So what do you want to add? 
uh, well, I, I want I want to add that uh, this the whole this the these so-called so authorities of the occupied territories are totally sustained by Russia. If Russia and the whole conflict, the whole situation we are talking about today is caused by Russian military aggression against Ukraine and by Russians Russia's continuous support of the situation and even escalation. So if Russia moves away and stops uh, financing the so-called authorities of the occupied territories, the conflict will be resolved um, in its own way uh, after some period of time. Uh, of course, there will be a lot of um, post-conflict uh, problems which have to be solved, but still uh, the conflict continues only because Russia uh, continues uh, supports it. Moreover, uh, Russia is not um, is not willing to allow for some sort of security situation in the in the region. Yeah, uh, there was a ceasefire uh, in uh, July last year, and we know what happened. Yeah, uh, since the beginning of this year, uh, a lot of Ukrainian soldiers were killed, so there was no the, the, the ceasefire does not hold any longer. And this is a very important problem. Uh, there was also initiative of the UN, uh, or there was a discussion about possible UN peacekeeping mission. Russia did not agree on that. Uh, uh, even OSCE cannot fulfill its mandate. Yeah, according to the Minsk agreements, OSCE should control the whole occupied territory or should be, have access up to the Ukrainian-Russian border. And the OSCE doesn't have even this. Uh, so we don't have a minimum conditions for some sort of peacekeeping, some sort of security uh, situation. And because Russia doesn't want this, yeah. Um, and uh, as long as this prevails, we will have a lot of uh, new victims and problems. Uh, yeah. Um, James, the other panelists have mentioned the uh, lack of will from the Russian side to improve the situation. Do you have any possibilities to coordinate humanitarian aid in the territories not controlled by Ukrainian government to coordinate them with Russia, with Moscow? Are there channels open? Does it work? Um, we, we, don't, we don't coordinate with the, the Moscow authorities directly. We don't have a presence there. Um, we're in, we're, we are you know, accredited to, to Ukraine. Through, through the Secretariat to the permanent mission of the Russian Federation, we do uh, exchange and we request uh, support in, in, uh, in us gain, gaining access. But for, for purposes of actually operational purposes, we do speak with the so-called uh, humanitarian committees in both Donetsk and Luhansk and meet regularly with the, uh, the de facto entities there to coordinate the assistance that we do provide. And so, we have regular visits that we go to have meetings to discuss how we can gain more access and constantly are making the case to, to gain more access to more populations. Um, in many cases, this has not been successful. Um, to give an example of, of a coal distribution program, a multi-million dollar one, to get the poorest of the most vulnerable people, elderly, um, through the winter uh, to distribute coal. This wasn't an issue of, of, of transporting it across the contact line, it's simply procuring it and giving it to, to the people that are in most need. We were not able to get the project approved. So it's hard to see um, wh where uh, the interests are because clearly this would benefit the population um, that is in most in need. And so for us, it seemed that there was not an interest in, in, in helping that, that population. At the same time, we have large um, projects to do reconstruction of shelters that have been damaged by, by the ongoing conflict and continue to be, to be damaged. Um, some are bigger scale than others, depending on the nature of, of, the, uh, of the damage, could just be simply replacing windows, other times it's replacing roofs and the like. Um, and for months, we've had in difficulty in getting approval for the, for the activity. And so it sits there not happening. And so you get through the winter, somehow, the population survives. And if you take very um, specific examples of the elderly living in these houses, and as it was mentioned earlier, this is the, as we call the oldest uh, crisis in the world because those who could leave have left. And so what you're left with is elderly pensioners, people living on their own that don't have anywhere else to go. And so they're staying in their falling down houses and shacks. And to get through the winter, in many cases, having to to go in with their other elderly neighbors to, to share one room where they could afford to, to, to pay for the heating of that one room, which of course is a terrible situation when you're talking about COVID and preventing the spread of, of COVID when you actually want to make sure people can stay apart. Um, so 
it's hard to say. Last year, we, we are regularly notified by the Russian Federation of the permanent mission in, in New York when they send a humanitarian convoy. And we've noted that last year there were five convoys sent, nothing in the first six months. And then there was one in July and then one each month except for September. Um, now we are not able to monitor what's actually in these convoys, um, but in many cases or most cases, they were, it was last year with medical supplies. Um, we don't know uh, of what other things are being sent. Clearly there's, there's as Irina is talking about, there's financial support that's, that's sent. We have no way of knowing what that is or, or the levels that is. Um, and so it's, it's a difficult environment to, to work. And those people that we are working with, these are, are Ukrainians like anyone else and have very limited ability to take care of themselves. Some of them are forced because of the closure of the contact line to travel you know, through the uncontrolled border to the Russian Federation and then pass back into the government controlled area of, of Luhansk um, through a Milova crossing point with, with the Russian Federation. This is not legal and it's against the, the framework and they get fines. But at some point, if you have no means and you've had now a year of accrued pension of $100 a month, well, $1,200 is getting a bit better. Um, and if it costs you $100 or $200 to do that and another $100 in fines, you, if you can get $900 and you have some means to go and, and, and take care of yourself. This is not assistance. This is pension. This is the income that the population has accrued over the years. And the fact that there's a large percentage of the population elderly population of pension age that has been cut off from their access to their pensions means you know, even increases the vulnerability even more. And so this makes a very difficult situation. And if I could just quickly get onto the, uh, the point of the, these territories right along the contact line that, that Irina was mentioning, the so-called civil military administrations, these areas, four of them still haven't had to have their military, civil military, um, uh, heads appointed yet, and so they don't have access to their funds for this year. But the the issue in the government-controlled areas is after seven years, much of this area is no different from areas in the rest of Ukraine, and, and they should be receiving services like in many, many er other areas. And so the United Nations and our humanitarian partners, we're trying to shift out of humanitarian assistance. I mean, there's no point in trucking water into a town when they should be getting, you know, development of, the, of their water systems so they can have regular, re regular water. Of course, in the, the settlements and villages that are right on the contact line are continuing to become under fire. That's purely a humanitarian situation. But for many of the other areas where we're providing assistance, they should be mainstreamed into the regular development programming, the programs of the government, the government development. Um, and we should be getting out of the humanitarian business in these areas um, and focusing it on those areas that are truly in, in humanitarian needs. Uh, James, one question. We have one question from the audience. Um, and as you were talking about figures, I hope that you can answer this question. Jan Maas wants to know how many people approximately left the so-called uh, DNR um, once public republic Ukraine and Russia in 2020. Can you answer this? Um, um, I certainly can't talk about how many people left Russia or Ukraine. Um, but frankly, the numbers are very difficult. The, the last census was conducted in 2001. We know the people that, that were displaced during the conflict and the figure, the 1.4 million, one, it, it's not a real figure either. Um, it's, it's so, it, it, the numbers are very hard. I've heard different estimates recently, you know, some very, very low figures of no more than about a million people in the whole don um, the non-government controlled areas. That, that figure is clearly very low. I mean, while you go there, it, when you walk on the street, you can definitely sense that the, the population is more aged than a population, you know, in the rest of Ukraine. And so you, you know that the, a lot of the younger people or the families have left, those who have options. Um, and so you, you see a population, a much older population. But the figures, I mean, we, we've been using a figure of around 3 million people in the non-government controlled areas, which is slightly lower than it was in, in 2014, obviously with the, the number of displacement. But to say how many people left last year, we, you know, officially, we know how many people cross the crossing points, but of course, many people cross into Russia and we don't have any figures for the numbers that have crossed on that. And of those who did cross through the official crossing points, those, they cross in both, both directions. We had, there's a net of maybe 5,000 people that, that left that didn't return in terms of the total numbers that crossed. And so that, that doesn't tell you very much about the numbers. And so the, the vast majority appear to be going out through the, uh, the non-controlled um, border with the Russian Federation. 
-hmm. I would like to talk a bit more uh, still about um, the media and um, um, Alexi mentioned earlier that, yeah, it's also maybe the individual the, um, decision of journalists who want don't want to be war journalists. Not everybody wants to report about uh, conflicts and so on. Um, Irina, you are working for Lipmod for a think tank that uh, raises that is lobbying Ukraine. Um, how do you raise attention for the situation in Ukraine and what topics meet interest? Well, first, we, okay, uh, this is a, a question outside of the focus of our discussion, but uh, I can answer it, of course. Um, if we talk about media coverage on Ukraine, of course, it's focused on the military conflict, um, perhaps less on the humanitarian situation um, uh, provoked by it. Uh, it, con it focuses on corruption, on oligarchs, which is, of course, the case in Ukraine. But there are many, many other things uh, which are worth to be reporting, uh, reporting about Ukraine, um, very vibrant civil society, which has impact on the policy making in Ukraine. Um, a lot of um, uh, a lot of startups, which also uh, are very successful, uh, a lot of creativity, um, uh, also interesting development in the sphere of culture, and um, a lot of reform successes. Of course, uh, uh, more could have been done, but since 2014, Ukraine has achieved uh, much more than it has during uh, all years of its independence, and it has to be recognized um, uh, and, and covered, we, so we try to do it. And uh, one of the important issues Libmod is also promoting is, of course, um, the understanding uh, that Russia um, is not a part of the um, security uh, solution for Europe. Yeah? So Russia is not interested in security. When we talk about security in Europe, it's undermining European security. And it's important for all Western partners to understand this and to act respectively. Uh, apparently, the sanctions which were imposed on Russia um, because of the um, this um, because of the occupation of Crimea and of occupation of the Donbas, uh, Russia has adjusted to the sanctions, and they are not sufficient to um, to make the sustenance of this conflict for Russia costly. Uh, U.S. has been able to stop um, this military buildup of Russia. Basically, maybe Russia was testing U.S. or the West in this with this military buildup. U.S. was very resolute and was able to show that um, it can draw red lines. But uh, Germany and France reactions were very weak. And uh, one of the issues about Germany is that Germany still uh, wants to continue to finalize the uh, uh, Nord Stream 2 project. Uh, which which also means uh, corruption because a lot of people in the West uh, will be, will receive corrupt money if the project becomes operational, and um, Ukrainian security will be undermined by this by this project because uh, Ukraine um, Ukrainian um, uh, tra uh, gas transit will be undermined. Uh, so uh, this shows that uh, Germany, for instance, uh, could could do more in terms of uh, raising the costs of this uh, of the maintenance of this conflict for Russia uh, and uh, France as well, and the EU as such. EU as such is not a security actor. EU has a very important Eastern Partnership program, which covers Ukraine and other five countries on the eastern borders. And uh, we see that EU is not a security actor at all. EU does not have a security solution. All of these countries have some sort of pros and conflicts and they are, all, uh, they are all provoked and sustained by Russia and EU cannot do anything here. So there is a big problem in terms of what West can do to uh, withstand Russian ag aggression, Russian imperialism uh, and uh, what the West can do to be resilient to this kind of military build up we witnessed recently. Alexei, is um, the um, attention of the West big enough for Ukraine? Uh, of course, I think it's not enough uh, for Ukraine now, this attention. And I read in New York uh, Times and Washington Post. And usually I faced with the uh, information about political estimation from Ukraine. It's anti-corruption and 
the governance of Ukraine and others. But of course, uh, some requests from my colleague from Western uh, media and uh, countries, sometimes I've got this request and every time we try to explain what happened, especially in occupied territory, because Ukrainian part, this openly you can, you can move free through all territory and get the different information. But the main problem and the, the, this is the, the main gap, this is the occupied territory, because this is the black uh, zone for independent media and our colleagues who continue their work and, and get information from that side, it's every day surviving and every day they try to hide their activities and because our TV channel Dome that launched uh, last year, we also try to get information from Occupy Territory, from Crimea, and we know the cost of these short videos from that side. So in my opinion, uh, Western media should be more focused on the Occupy Territory firstly, and uh, democratic process that now continue in Ukraine, this is average process for every East Europe countries and po or post-Soviet countries and absolutely normally process we have. But the most important, this is situation in uncontrolled territory. I agree with you totally, but it's very difficult to get access to the territories. And uh, there is even a blacklist for Western journalists and uh, usually Moscow-based correspondents do cover the region, but they can't uh, get access because they can't, of course, enter from Russia and uh, it's very complicated, but anyhow, even if they have the funding and the, uh, the money to, to travel and to spend two weeks or so for a research trip, then they might be not let in simply at the, uh, the so-called border so, or at the front line. Um, so maybe James or also um, Igor, could you, is it possible, imaginable that you would perhaps organize press trips, including visiting the occupied territories? From my side, I mean, it's very difficult to, to organize. Each individual will have to get approval to be allowed in. And so while we regularly organize visits, either with media or with uh, the diplomatic Corps or anybody in, in Ukraine to the east into government controlled areas because there's no issues and limitations on that. I think it would be very difficult to have someone accompany us um, across because frankly, it's very difficult. We have to have very difficult negotiations to get ourselves across these days with COVID and the restrictions with COVID. It's become much more difficult over the last year. And just to note that COVID is really being used as a political tool to separate the, the population. I mean, it's the um, the difficulties with which people are able to cross and the excuse being used as, as COVID, I mean, it's it's ridiculous. Those who formerly used to cross from Donetsk, it would be about maybe 400, 500,000 people would be crossing every month to go to the government controlled side. Now you're seeing maybe a thousand or 800 every month that are, sorry, that's about both ways. So 400 able to cross one direction. I mean, the numbers and the restrictions are not, are really tied to the, um, to the politics and not on the, the real situation. And so I think uh, the limitations are, are so great that I think it would be very difficult to, for us to be able to bring any journalist um, across. Um, but again, we would be willing to do so if they were able to get permission, they could certainly accompany us. Uh, we have very good relations with, with journalists. Igor, what do you think? I fully agree with James. I'm afraid I would be more than willing to organize such a thing, but uh, in the case of the occupied territories, we talk about uh, strictly and tightly controlled authoritarian regimes where access is uh, very limited. And uh, yeah, as you have mentioned also, you see them in general sub blacklisted. But, the, and this relates also to the question that you have asked uh, previously uh, about information, what is actually happening there. Um, I mean, we are talking still about the region, which is not as small as many things, but also not as big as many things. And particularly if you consider the amount of IDPs that you have in different uh, cities of the government controlled areas. And many of these IDPs, but also non IDPs have family and have still contacts and relatives living in the occupied territories. I mean, recently I was just walking 
with a friend from Donetsk and uh, we were strolling around Slovence and she just said, oh, this person here on the street lived just in the same courtyard as I did. Um, and of course, many people because of the war do not keep in touch anymore with people for political reasons uh, living or who decided to stay in the, uh, in the occupied territories. But others on the other hand, try just like to avoid politics and stay in touch with family and relatives if it's possible. So they try to continue and keep a channel with them. Um, so maybe like, maybe there is a possibility, I don't know, in a nicer future or maybe under the circumstances that we have now to keep up some kind of dialogue with people living there. And it's definitely important. The COVID situation also, as James mentioned, and I fully agree there, um, tightened even the control who has access, who can move uh, from the uh, occupied territories to the government control areas. So um, the exchange, keeping up any kind of channel, which is possible between the territories is the only future and uh, the only possibility actually to talk about the future re reintegration in the region and like to keep basically the idea of a common of a common and whole of Ukraine together. Before we go to into the last round, I would like to encourage uh, the audience to uh, send your questions via the question and answer tool. Um, one thing I would like to talk about also is um, the relationship between humanitarian aid and cooperation for humanitarian purposes and um, uh, accepting the non-accepted uh, illegal uh, representatives and authorities of the so-called republics. This is really, this creates problems, I guess. And we have a question here from Eckhart Lut. He is, quest he, is um, he wants to know, should Ukraine negotiate with Russia water supply of the, of the Crimea to avoid a war which would force a way to the Dnieper. This is also uh, a question that fits the context. So negotiations with Russia or with the so-called separatists for getting a um, better situation on the ground. Um, yeah, who, who would like to answer? Maybe Alexi will start. Uh, it's very political uh, question about water to Crimea, of course, and uh, some uh, some tracks of this negotiation. I know that uh, they were in the history a process, and also sometimes these questions they uh, discussed during even during Minsk uh, trilateral group. But the most important question, it is, in my opinion, uh, a quotable access to government services uh, like, uh, for all territory of Ukraine, include Crimea and occupied territory, because this is the most important key for the social uh, cohesion and, and the mitigate the uh, like and for uh, and mitigate the social uh, tension in uh, both on both sides of uh, contact line. So if I don't know what the model should be for uh, Crimea water or uh, services for people who live in uh, occupied territory of Crimea, but I know about the steps of Ukrainian government toward average people in Donbas in occupied territory, I mean pensions, I mean social services, and also the hubs in the border near in the in 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 the checkpoints uh, where people can get absolutely free a lot of uh, state services from Ukrainian side, and I think this is the big step since 2019 that Kyiv did toward average people. Irina, will this work? No, I agree with uh, with Oleksi that indeed the, the treatment of people in the occupied territories has improved on the side of the Ukrainian government. And there is a, a reasonable policy of supporting these people, but which is of course complicated by the COVID. 
Uh, with respect to Crimea, it's a difficult, it, of course, it's a difficult question um, because um, Russia just annexed the, the, this, uh, the peninsula and uh, it's a it's a very it's it's a it's a military enclave. It's um, uh, human rights situation is terrible. Uh, it's difficult. Uh, it's a difficult situation for Ukraine. Ukraine cannot sustain this kind of regime and this kind of um, uh, yeah this, this regime. Yes. Uh, so um, Russia should do some concessions as well. Yeah. So uh, there could be negotiations if Russia were willing also to. To, to negotiate and do something, but there is no, this is not the case. So the Ukraine cannot do much here, I guess. My, my vision of the situation is so. Uh, I agree with you that the Ukraine can't do much. I uh, would like to know if media could do more. Sabine Wilke at the beginning said that no attention, no media attention means no aid, means no political will. Uh, to solve the crisis. But to be honest, I doubt very much that more media attention would lead to other politics in the Kremlin and that um, Vladimir Putin would change his politics. So um, what do you think about this, Igor? What uh, really, does it help more media attention in this respect? There is something which um, I think Oleksiy mentioned in the very beginning, and this is something that we need to consider when we speak about media attention, that we are talking about <clears throat> different media bubbles that party don't even overlap anymore. So when we talk about the uh, Russian media bubble, Russian state media, the uh, media that we have in the occupied uh, territories, it's a totally different reality that people are living in, totally different news that they're reporting, um, and totally different... Uh, perceptions of people are also um, developing about the situation they are living in. And uh, yeah, I, so solving only, solving only more, report, more reporting doesn't solve anything in this regard. So this is also why I appreciate, for instance, also the work of the Telekanal Dom that Alexei is working for, which tries to reach out to, to people living in the occupied territories because um, we, we need somehow to break the bubbles that we are living in. So. Um, basically try to understand also what is, let's say, the other side, what are other people thinking, how can we communicating, communicate at least uh, about the same topics anymore, how can we find a common ground um, in which we can at least exchange some kind of arguments despite of different realities we're living in, which does not mean that we, uh, that every reality and every reality is true about something there is definitely something which is uh, more fact-based or evidence-based than other things and uh, also during the COVID times and this is what we have been um, observing during a small humanitarian project we did in 2020 to the, together with some civil society organizations um, there was massive misinformation disinformation and mistrust spread along the contact line in areas uh, close uh, the so-called gray zones, territories cl uh, um, close or settlements, isolated settlements in a, proxim in a proximity of around 20 kilometers to the contact line. So um, people were just hearing, for instance, that COVID is a big conspiracy by the Rothschilds, for instance, and uh, wasn't uh, created because, uh, because uh, the Americans want to undermine Russian power or something. So people are living this reality and this creates kind of a massive confusion in their heads and but this is despite of the obvious uh, let's say nonsense that these media is reporting this is the reality people are living in so it, you need to communicate somehow to get people um, back to some kind of dialogue i think i made my point clear <clears throat> um i think it's very clear that um and an improvement of the humanitarian situation can't be achieved without a political solution of the conflict. Um, is there a possibility? How can people on the ground living there participate in the peace process? And especially in the non-recognized, uh, non-governmental controlled areas? Oleksii. Uh, Many civil society and international NGOs uh, already implementing this building process in Donbass region, and Igor, he is there present. Uh, 
one of these projects that helps people to build, uh, to, to create this peace building process. But in this, the, in, the, in the other hand, uh, I think that uh, not very big number of people understand what does it mean peace building process and what does it mean dialogue in the, our Ukrainian estimation. And, but if we say about this process, in my opinion, what does it mean? It's dialogue between different communities. It is a promote good governance, Irina mentioned that, and also empower conflict affected communities. For example, I know about the dialogue between Ukrainian and Russian women. Uh, this, they are uh, peace activists and they implemented these ideas about conversation through contact line. And also uh, in Donbass region and in Hersonia, Crimea, there are also different projects I know about decentralization and um, strengthening local uh, go governance for uh, these small communities. And the example, what we mentioned during this discussion today, this is Dome TV channel as a part of humanitarian response, because especially on this TV channel, we discuss and we promote the humanitarian values for people in occupied territory, but also for people in Ukrainian part of Donbass and Kherson Sky Oblast. And another activities where I'm involved, it's Donbass Media Forum. We also try to focus on this very specific and difficult topic that name peace building process in Ukraine. So there is definitely the need for more dialogue. Irina, uh, you wanted to make a point on media attention and please be short because we are running out of time. I just want to mention that it's important to, uh, to pay attention to the work of Ukrainian human rights organizations who cover the situation in the occupied territories in Crimea. They receive uh, the, the, the information from uh, sources which cannot be disclosed. Uh, these people work in very difficult conditions and, and still they're able to support, uh, to give information. So it's very important to talk about this. And especially it's important to monitor the processes in Crimea. For this purpose, Ukrainian government has launched a so-called Crimean Forum. It will start in uh, August because everybody seems to have forgotten about Crimea, focusing on the Donbass. It's important to talk about Crimea and its long-term future. And this is where media should look at, I think. Thank you, Irina. So we have only two minutes left and I will use it for a uh, try to summarize this uh, very diverse discussion. We touched uh, very many different points, I guess. Um, we still, yeah, uh, you, know, you, you mentioned at the beginning that it's a complicated issue and I think it has become even more complicated after this discussion. Although I hope that uh, we made uh, many points clear also. I think, um, Really, uh, there is a need for dialogue. There is uh, lots. There are lots of obstacles, like, for example, lack of access to the regions, lack of access of journalists, of people, of NGOs who will provide, who can provide humanitarian aid. Um, I would like to thank my panelists. Thank you for your discussion and your contribution. Dear audience, thank you for your attention and questions. Before you leave, I want to remind you that the next discussion on underreported crisis will be about the Central African Republic, where Russia also plays a role, by the way. It will be on 18th of May. Have a nice remaining evening and stay 